Welcome everyone to this Q&A session of Movies That Matter. Um, we will discuss the movie Colombia in my arms, which you've all been watching just now. Um, my name is Jori Horsthuis. I'm a journalist and a political scientist. I'm writing about tra transitional justice for international media. And I will have a, a conversation with Jenny Kivitsteu and uh, Jussi Rastas, uh, the directors of the movie, and also uh, with Beatrix Mayans. Um, she is a lawyer and a PhD candidate, and uh, she knows a lot about the situation in Colombia. Um, so we will talk about the beautiful documentary that we've just seen and the transitional uh, justice process in Colombia. This talk will take about 30 to 45 minutes, and I hope you enjoy it. So let's start with introducing the speakers. Maybe uh, Beatrice, you can go first. Yes, sure. Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be with all of you here today and to be in the presentation of such a wonderful and powerful documentary, uh, Colombia in my arms. I really enjoyed it. And well, I'm a PhD candidate um, at FU University and also the Netherlands Institute for the Study of Crime and Law Enforcement. And I'm studying punishment and sanctions for international crimes. And I have a uh, as a case study, the case of Colombia. So I'm really uh, glad that I can participate here today and speak uh, and have a nice talk with all of you on the transitional process initiated in Colombia. Thank you very much. So let's go to Finland. Hello. Yes, we are directors uh, of the film. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here to, to discuss uh, and, and of course, with, uh, with this like important topic of uh, justice matters in Colombia. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. And it's uh, really a ple pleasure to uh, be here with you. Thank you. Could you please introduce yourself a little bit? <laughs> My name is Jossi Rastas. Uh, and here we have Jenny Kivista. <laughs> we are both uh, documentary filmmakers. And uh, yeah, as you said, we, we are in Finland, we are Finnish, uh, but we both have like a long background in, in Latin America and that's uh, why we made this film in, in Colombia. Why, why did you become passionate about uh, Latin America? No, oh. <laughs> I think the question <laughs> we is go just back like... Uh, long time. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> back to when I was 19 years old, I, I just happened to be in Colombia and uh, uh, I loved the uh, country. I fall in love in the country, and then I have been living life back and forth to Finland to Colombia, and yeah, it's like another country of mine. I feel like like that. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, we did know each other back then. Uh, I went there. I, it, it, it was actually the same year. Uh, I I went to uh, Latin America first time in two thousand and five. I was uh, working in Peru. And uh, it was a mind blowing experience. I was traveling all around and uh, then I have been traveling and uh, living between Finland and, and Latin America in Peru, Colombia, Chile. And uh, yeah, it's very, very uh, like own, own backyard. Uh, yeah, it's uh, somehow maybe easier to be there than in, in Finland or Europe. <laughs> mm. So what uh, motivated you to make this movie? It's, uh, it was 2016, December, we were in Colombia, actually, because of uh, we were going to be there like a, a vacation, actually. And then it was just a peace process going on in the country. So basically everybody, they were talking about peace and there was really like big belief that this is, the, this is going to be a big step for the country and and yeah certain kind of hope that i have never never felt before uh so yeah that kind of track us to to leave the vacation and start to filming yeah, the we, process we got an opportunity to to visit a guerrilla camp and we had like an access uh we were allowed to be there for like four days or, or something like that then it became like one month and uh, mm -hmm. then in the end we we spent with them like uh, 
for five months during one year and a half we were filming in Colombia. Wow. Yeah, I was curious, how did you get this access to the FARC? Yeah, it was uh, uh, like um, after the meeting, like a certain kind of persons that knew uh, the guerrilla leaders and, and, and they had access. So uh, yeah, they made connections and they could, we could go to the camp. And did they um, uh, ask you for any like conditions? Uh, how um, for you to, to be able to film? It was actually very relaxed uh, when we arrived there. Uh, of course, they asked uh, like uh, like uh, where are we from and uh, who we are working for and so on. Back then, we of course we didn't have like uh, uh, we didn't know what it how how it was gonna be and uh, how like a big production it. Uh, was about to become that time but but actually it was like very relaxed and there were no like nothing restricted things mm -hmm. it was actually very interesting that they, they they didn't and no no one if we are talking about all of the characters of the film like uh mm, no one really was asking us like uh, what's it gonna be and 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 mm -hmm. so on so it was very interesting yeah i yeah. think a lot because we are not <clears throat> Colombians and we are not from the US or any other country like uh, could have like conflicting interests with Colombia um, like Finland if you say that you are from Finland it's just <laughs> no one knows uh, anything about Finland <laughs> so it's just a uh, uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, we gain trust with the people yeah yeah because I was also curious about the man uh, the character from the elite he was also quite special, I would say. How, how did you get introduced to him? Or how did you find him? It was like many things in this filming <laughs> were like kind of accidents or casual meet. Like we, it's coincidence. Coincidence. Yeah, it was coincidence that we met with him. Of course, we were looking someone from the city uh, who opposes park or maybe from the elites, but we never expected to find anyone like like him. Mm -hmm. That's but that's the wonderful thing in documentaries. <laughs> yeah. So like uh, we had like um, like field producers in Colombia. Like uh, uh, they actually were never with us, but they were like uh, providing uh, connections and accesses for us. Uh, and we just uh, said to to one of them that uh, we would need someone. Like when we had filmed like for one month, we said that we would need someone that uh, uh, doesn't like FARC and is maybe, uh, yeah, living in a city. And that's it. Like these were mm -hmm. all, all only characters. And uh, then uh, he was asking around and then uh, his friend had told that uh, he knows someone that is very cinematic person. And uh, we met him. And uh, when we met this person, uh, we were like, uh, it was like mind, mind blowing because like uh, uh, he was so much more uh, what we had expected because he, he brought like 500 years uh, to, to the film mm -hmm. yeah. because colonial, of his background. Colonial yeah. roots and uh, that was really interesting because before that, just before that we were uh, with, uh, we had been with uh, coca farmers in, in the jungle and there's this scene with the coca farmer explaining how they feel, how the Af African-Americans feel, feel like to be the slaves of, uh, of today also. So that was really interesting that this coca farmer brought us back to the colonialism and then straight in the city mm -hmm. we meet the colonialism. Mm -hmm. and, and, Colonial he, he, and he was the first person we were introduced to, like... Uh... Wow. <laughs> When we were searching for someone that would hate hate FARC and would live in in the city, <laughs> very. And, and Beatrice, could you please um, uh, give us or share some some first uh, impressions of the of the documentary? Yes, yeah, sure. Well, I think that definitely it's a very powerful documentary because indeed it shows all the complexities and challenges that the transitional justice process 
uh, that initiated in 2016 with this final peace agreement with between Las Farc and the um, government of former president Juan Manuel Santos. And unfortunately, these challenges persist uh, today. And I would say that they are still even stronger and more obstacles to the implementation of the agreement. And I think it's related to what um, Jenny and Josie also said uh, about um, yeah, the, 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 the elite and, and the fight of power that is now in Colombia. And I think that this is something very valuable from the documentary because indeed it brings into the film the perspectives and opinions of different actors. So it does not only include the FARC and, and their opinions and way of living, for example, and that transition at the beginning of the implementation of the peace agreement, but it brings also the farmers, the co uh, coca leaves farmers. It also brings uh, the opinion of the political opposing party to the agreement that it's now uh, in power and still it's uh, against the implementation of the agreement. And I'm, I was also very impressed of this member of the um, e e elite um, in Colombia that it's ruling. And it was also really interesting to um, see how he explained and he's aware of this um, contextual and historical situation that persists today and explains a lot the motives behind and the reasons giving uh, uh, birth or initiating the conflict. So um, indeed all the, the, the different uh, actors that are shown in the movie also stress this point. So is the political and economical regime that has been there for several uh, decades and even centuries and that it's still in place and that has marginalized a big part of the society um, and then made them take up arms and try to change this uh, unequal uh, regime um, with, with arms or with other means, right? So for me, it was very um, uh, important and special that indeed this documentary includes the these different perspectives, uh, because I've seen previous uh, films on Colombia, and I think sometimes they are focused on one of the actors and the parties, and they're also that's great, but I think that this one brings together these different opinions and also um, shows, uh, gets more into depth in the underlying reasons of why the conflict is there, and also why it has a lot of opposition uh, right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seemed also from the movie that actually almost every party to this conflict is skeptical, skeptical about the uh, peace agreement. And I was very curious, uh, maybe Beatrice, you can start answering this question. Um, what happened after 2016, uh, the peace uh, deal? Mm -hmm. um, because I think a lot of developments uh, have happened after that. Yes, sure. Well, uh, indeed, the peace agreement was signed in 2016, and I wanted to, to just explain a little bit what is the agreement on, because uh, people usually just think, when we think about transitional justice and transitional process, we only think about criminal investigations and prosecutions, and all the attention goes towards that. But the noble part of the peace agreement in Colombia is that it is a very comprehensive agreement that indeed tries to go and tackles the underlying reasons uh, that gave uh, initiated the, the conflict. So uh, very quickly, I wanted to explain that the agreement has six central points. And for example, the first one is on rural reform. So giving the land back to these uh, farmers, to communities that were displaced, to victims, and also to FARC members. So they can start a life and then continue uh, being uh, productive and reintegrating to society. Also political participation, for example, that is essential because this left movement uh, 
that uh, started uh, the, the, the conflict with the left and liberals versus conservative, they wanted to change the regime within the system, but they couldn't. So then um, now they took up arms. Well, there were several groups, of course, not only FARC, but then they took up arms. And now, of course, they want to change things from the system. So they want political participation. And that's another fundamental point. We also have, of course, the disarmament and reincorporation of demobilized combatants that it's also necessary because you cannot put in jail thousands of, of, of um, combatants or perpetrators. You also have the solution to the illicit crops and narco-traffic um, in the agreement as well. And you have the fifth point, which is very important because it, it is the point on victims. And uh, this is something that must be said that the agreement has at its centers, the victims and their participation. And this point has the creation of a truth commission, the creation of a special jurisdiction for peace, which is a, a special tribunal that is in charge of investigating and prosecuting the crimes uh, that were committed within the conflict, including international crimes, a special commission to look for the disappeared people uh, within the conflict. And finally, the implementation and verification point where the UN is playing a very important role in looking that the, this agreement is uh, implemented. So as you can see, it's very comprehensive and goes beyond the traditional discussion that transitional societies uh, have of uh, just in criminal tribunals or investigations and maybe a truth commission. So it goes beyond that. And of course, uh, some people say, well, it could have included more things and it could be, have been more comprehensive of course, but I think that it is such a, a comprehensive system that even it has been supported internationally and nationally. And at the beginning of the year, for example, the UN Security Council gave its unanimous support again to the, to the uh, implementation of the agreement. And it has been considered as an example to other, um, other peace processes. So I think uh, definitely it's very relevant, but as I was saying, there are tensions because of course there are interests at play with changing the economic and political system, of course, and these interests clashes, of course, and then you see that um, FARC members are being killed, also uh, human rights leaders and indigenous leaders, uh, because there are also international and national interests at place with uh, finishing the conflict and changing the regime there. Yeah, and um, uh, Jenny, um, uh, I heard that um, the beginning of 2021 was like the most violent up to now since, since 2016. Could you tell us a little bit more about the developments also from your point of view? Yeah, as we started to, uh, to film this film, <laughs> and then uh, there was really this hope in the air. And then after after about a year or something, everything started to collapse. So there were a lot of like all these points, uh, all these points uh, we discussed now. It's uh, like really few of those were fulfilled or have been fulfilled until. 2021, yeah, there is really concerning amount of murders in Colombia. Uh, it's it's rising the FARC uh, also. There are dissident groups of uh, of FARCs uh, that uh, different kind of dissidents, some ideological, some not. Um, that there is a huge problems in inequality in the society that it's not dealt. It they, they like. There is a feeling that the government or the people in the power doesn't want to deal with a real problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, for example, in the film, we saw uh, uh, the military burning down the coca fields, but uh, it wasn't really clear to me if they um, gave the perspective of, of any alternative for the people who are living in rural areas. Some were, some were given like some money, it was actually money. And mm -hmm. uh, money is not maybe the best uh, solution there. There should be like 
education on, on these alternatives. Uh, but there was like, a, what I understood, uh, there, was a, there was a program for the farmers um, that, that they would uh, substitute the coca. But uh, in this program, there were only like, uh, it was a limited amount of, of, <laughs> of uh, farmers. So like what happens to the rest of them that, uh, that, that uh, and, and uh, those who receive money, uh, uh, some, some were not receiving the money even though they were in the program, but those who received the money, uh, as they knew that uh, how things work many times in Colombia and uh, there was going to be the elections, uh, many of them, uh, they were planting already uh, coca fields like, uh, uh, so, so the military was taking the, the, maybe your coca field and that was agreed upon, but uh, then they had uh, a new coca field in another place because they, they couldn't be sure that, uh, that uh, the promise would be fulfilled. And actually it seems that they were right in mm -hmm. many, many cases. Have you been in touch with the, with the main characters since you um, yeah. ended the movie? Yeah. How are yeah. they? Uh, the main character, the Clark, Clark ex Clark Guerrilla, um, Ernesto, he's, uh, he's doing pretty fine right now. He has a local business uh, that he's starting with the clothes. And uh, I, I'm like, we are really happy to know that he's, he's well and he's safe. He has been receiving some, um, like, I mean, uh, threats. Threats, yeah. He has been receiving some threats, uh, but he's fine. And uh, unfortunately, the coca farmers, like we, we have been touched with some, some of them, uh, they are in really still in really difficult condition. They needed to move uh, to another place uh, from the area they were used they were used to used to live, because the conflict there is uh, has been taking place again. Uh, so they are looking forward to to survive in difficult conditions. Mm -hmm. And they had been like uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, I read. Uh, the place where we, the region we, we, we were filming in Nariño, uh, uh, there were, there have been many massacres taking place. Like the last one was just a couple of days ago, uh, very, very close to the place we were filming. Uh, and yeah, at, at the moment, it, it seems to be a very dangerous place because there are new armed troops, nothing to do with FARC necessarily, but new just any groups there are many many illegal groups that some of them maybe don't have even a name but uh, yeah that's the situation at the moment and could you take us uh, a bit more behind the scenes of this this project uh, what um, yeah what what kind of difficulties did you encounter hmm hmm I think the biggest uh, challenge we had actually in the edition, because uh, we, this was like a multi-character story and uh, it was very political topic and uh, we wanted to create a, a film like a, to base the film on drama that is happening and not to provide or fill the film with uh, information. And uh, that's of course like a challenging job, uh, how to give uh, like a sufficient amount of information for the audience to understand the film, but uh, not reducing the drama. And that was like uh, one, one, one challenge. And maybe also that's something which is not really typical in this kind of documentaries that people, mm. audience expects maybe more information to what happened before in the war and, and so on. But that's not, uh, that was not our point. We wanted to really to follow the characters in the present now, what, what's happening now uh, in their lives and meeting people as, as person to person, really. Like uh, yeah. that's one of the, most uh, interesting things in this documentary when, when making it that uh, you start to see all these different colors in the not only black and white in the right and wrong but 
also understand to people. Yeah, yeah, I would say you took the axiom of show, don't tell really to the max. And uh, this intrigued me a lot uh, because it's 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 quite different than uh, than normal uh, documentaries, but uh, I found it really interesting because it also made the film um, more universal. I would say it's also about uh, the big gap uh, between politicians and citizens. Uh, it's about the huge inequality inequality uh, in uh, within a country. And by not giving all this information uh, about names, functions, places, context, uh, actually, I think you you managed to to yeah bring the story to to a more universal level. It could also have happened uh, in in other countries. Of course, the situation in Colombia is quite unique with the FARC, but still, I think many of the themes that you touched upon are really uh, universal ones. Um, so that was really, um, yeah, interesting to me. Uh, so thank you for that. And um, uh, I was also wondering um, if you could give like a, a, an anecdote of, of one of these days that you were filming um, in, the, in the jungle, the rural area, something that we didn't see, maybe... Um, um, uh, something that you took out of the movie, but that could be interesting for us as as viewers. Mm. <coughs> interesting things we took out of the movie because it just couldn't uh, feel a bit. It couldn't like, yeah, there was not enough space. I think we have like material for the another three movies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe but, one, uh, one anecdote, uh, which is actually very interesting, that uh, uh, the UN tried to prohibit us from filming in the camp. Really? And, uh, yeah, we, we, we didn't actually uh, accept that. <laughs> um, we talked with the guerrilla commander also, and, and according to him, uh, we could film in the camp, and according to the uh, UN uh, commander in the area, uh, we could not film in the camp. So then <clears throat> happened something <laughs> curious that we, we like guerrilla leader just told us like, okay, you can film, but just uh, hide when the new car comes in. So you, you could hide. And then there was a special person for like every each day to hide us <laughs> in, the, in the camp <laughs> when the UN comes. So that was kind of uh, curious that we were in the guerrilla camp. Hiding. Wow, so you had to hide for the UN instead of the guerrilla. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And but, then, yeah. Yeah, very strange. Because like, we, we think that uh, the people need to, they need to know what, what's happening in the camp and uh, like, and not like, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's not, not that wouldn't be uh, like a good thing for, for many that we couldn't film in the camp. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, we wanted to do what is right from our perspective and, and uh, from in general good, we, we continued filming in the camp. And Beatrice, uh, which, uh, which scene did you find most compelling? Well, it's difficult <laughs> to say definitely because I think that, yeah, I liked a lot uh, the movie in general and a lot of scenes really um, touched me. Uh, but, well, I think that one that really sticked uh, with me was this, um, yeah, in the camp actually, <laughs> where uh, there was this father uh, carrying her daughter, I think, and um, her daughter, his daughter, sorry, was trying to uh, touch and play with uh, the rifle or an arm. And also behind them, there was another woman with a baby. And yeah, I was just thinking and made me reflect, of course, that yeah, it's difficult to think how people would like to live in those situations, you know, like this was already the camp, but even before, like, you know, in, in the jungle and having all these risks and living and growing themselves, but also their family and children, you know? So yeah, it made me reflect how, um, 
Oftentimes, these people are pushed by these inequalities that we were talking about and, and these uh, power uh, yeah, play, you know, and uh, how they are pushed toward, towards that and getting arms and then fight for what they think is right and they believe. And that connects also with another scene that is uh, more towards the end of the, of the film of this uh, FARC member that was uh, throughout the, the movie um, that uh, Josie just uh, mentioned the name, but um, I just... Um... Ernesto. Ah, Ernesto, exactly. And he said at the end, well, I'm trying to teach my daughter um, how to, to, to have the ideas, revolutionary ideas, and to work in the future in the benefit of others and not to think only on herself. So I think that certainly it's an important message for future generations, but also for us in the sense that, yes, our actions impact uh, a lot, uh, not only of course the others, but yeah, in other countries as well. And uh, sometimes people really are in the need to, to fight for what they believe it's, it's right in other ways. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's um, wrong or also it's not justifiable sometimes, but it's, it's a more complex problem that we as a humanity, I think, and when we think also as well, uh, myself as a lawyer and from the academia as well, to think that these processes and transitional justice processes go deeper um, and we need to have a broader perspective of justice and peace and how to invite all the different parties to participate and really uh, find solutions, uh, sustainable solutions for these uh, countries in violence and yeah I'm from Mexico my country is also violent we also have uh, inequality issues so I think we need to to think deeper on how to to address them yeah and actually that's that's really good point like uh <clears throat> there was a baby boom in the camp uh there was a lot of babies <laughs> Uh, film also films of, of babies, but then they couldn't they couldn't uh, also put them all, all in the film. But there was really like this kind of change in the air and the people they believing they were believing the in the change and the better future. And uh, that's uh, if if these things are not resolved in the way that they we could give like the future generations the better better. Uh, the chances to to survive because if they go back to their villages and nothing changes really there is no rural development there's no schools there's no roads there's only armed groups and uh, stuff so then it's really easy to see everything repeating and actually what you said about the land uh, land um, reform that's really important point in the in the colombian peace process yeah and, and I, I i think like at least for me, the film is uh, about, uh, like, actually about European values. Uh, we norm normally tend to talk about these uh, positive values, the European, like, uh, good things, but uh, then there's this uh, greed as well. Uh, so there's like a contradiction in in the in the in in these European values, and that's that's. Uh, a big thing and uh, and also discussed in the in the film yeah and it also reminded me uh what what beatrice just said is that uh, at some point in the movie uh a woman is saying that uh it's also hard to give away her arms because it's it's like uh giving away a jacket or t uh yeah that her jacket is taken away and um she is, uh, it's, it's cold outside, so she need, needs it. And I was thinking, are these people also not uh, like, like all of us, um, grown up in this, this specific role that they had in society and it's difficult to, you know, change your identity actually. Mm. Yeah, and, and yeah, and in, in the film, uh, they are like, uh, I see that uh, all these people, uh, they are uh, all these different groups and characters. They they live in their own bubble, and that's uh, part of the problem. Uh, like uh, if you have spent all your life in the jungle uh, with your arms, what, what what can you expect 
if there are no alternatives. And also like uh, the guy from the LE, he has been living in, in, in those circles for his exactly. whole life. So everyone is uh, living there and there's, there, there's no connection. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they should form a country. So... Uh, and it's interesting that the people <coughs> criticizing the peace, peace uh, agreements, uh, they are normally living in the areas that the uh, war is not so daily present. So um, people who are living in these conflict areas, they, they normally support the peace agreement and forgiveness and all these, these things. So there's like these bubbles in the country, like several, mm -hmm. several reality that don't uh, meet and, each and, other. and if I think about myself if I was born in in this kind of bubble and spent all my life in in some of these bubbles I wouldn't be a better person like I would be exactly the same a FARC guy or the elite guy yeah so it depends yeah. where you where you born and where you uh, spend your life and that's yeah. not your choice. Yeah, and I think you showed that very well uh, in the movie. Um, my last question would be, because we, we almost have to wrap up, uh, what do you think about the prospects of uh, like a true lasting peace? Maybe first, uh, Beatrice, what, what do you think? Well, I think that uh, certainly right now the situation is difficult because uh, indeed there is not um, really the support that is needed for the peace agreement to be implemented with the current government. And as we discussed, yeah, members are being killed, also uh, human rights defenders. And um, I think that there needs to be political will from not only the ruling party, but from everyone in Colombia to really push forward to, uh, to, towards the implementation and then afterwards to reach a more sustainable peace. And I think that also, well, in my research, I'm also conducting empirical research and I, what, what I have detected from different uh, parties as well is that there's also a need of a lot of um, explanation uh, to the population in general of what the uh, process is about, what it entails and how people need to participate in this as well uh, to, to move it forward because there's also a lot of misinformation around and uh, it's also some education process on, on what entails uh, the whole process. So I think um, there is certainly possibilities to, to reach a more uh, sustainable solution. Of course, peace processes takes a lot of time and it require, requires several decades. And usually they are complex contexts. So it will be difficult, yes, but I think there's something already uh, strong there uh, that really it's like a foundation and you know there's several things to do and to uh, become better like the agreement and other needs and issues that need to be further solved but there's a good basis and there is international support as well so I think that uh, what is needed is political will on the one hand and on the other one, a lot of uh, education and information of what this process is about, what will entail, and also, of course, um, fulfilling what was agreed. Uh, because as, as Jenny and Juicy said, uh, it's important that they comply with the agreement, that they provide the farmers of, of coca leaves another uh, solution to, to, to of, of crops, for example, or that they do give the land to the people that they uh, agreed upon and uh, reparations to victims, etc. So indeed uh, fulfilling and complying with what was agreed and then further it um, in the future is, is essential for them to really uh, move towards a more uh, peaceful uh, Colombia. Yeni and, and Yusi, do you also think there's a good foundation for, uh, for the peace? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, difficult. <laughs> of course, I want to believe that, uh, of course, the country could change, the things could change, but uh, I agree completely that uh, 
then there has to be political will and especially political will because i i, I think people in colombia are quite uh, they are really willing to move forward. Uh, there has been like massive, massive manifestations uh, like uh, towards peace and uh, keeping keeping up with the peace agreements and uh, a young generation, especially. It's really, it's really, there is a hope uh, in them. Uh, but yeah, these things are really difficult and complex when it comes to the power of relationships and uh, and narcotraffics, uh, it's, that's a complete, really complex issue that is really difficult to find solutions if you don't want to look at in the, the problem into the eye and recognize the problem, mm. really. And, and how to affect the, the, the political will of Colombia? It uh, sounds like a difficult task. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, I, I personally believe in, in, in the young generation. I hope they will find a way somehow. And let's end uh, with a positive note. Uh, you told us that you are working on a new documentary. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Or is it all secret uh, still? <laughs> <laughs> it's still in the development. and uh, But it's really completely another story. Mm -hmm. More form story and uh, nothing, to, nothing to do with the war. But uh, maybe it's colonialism, yes. Sorry, on? It has to do something with the colonialism, mm -hmm. but in the African continent. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So thank you, Jenny and Yussi. Also, Beatrice, thank you very much for participating in this uh, Q&A. And of course, also, also to the audience, thank you very much for watching. Um, please check the other, other beautiful um, documentaries uh, at, um, and the in-depth programs at the Movies That Matter uh, website. And um, yeah, have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.